Good evening and welcome to the Ruth Ratner Miller Award Ceremony. The Friends of the Concord Free Public Library are honored to present the 2007 recipient of the Ruth Ratner Miller Award for Excellence in American History, John Hope Franklin. Scholar, academic, and living icon of the struggle for equality in America. To introduce our honoree, the Friends of the Library are also pleased to welcome Dr. Charles V. Willey tonight. The Friends, a nonprofit organization dedicating to enhancing the role of the library in the community through a variety of services and programs, would like to take this opportunity to thank the Trinitarian Congregational Church for providing us with such a historic venue for our award ceremony. The church was established in 1826. Within a decade, the Tricon Congregation declared, and I quote, its solid stance against slavery and became actively involved in assisting runaway slaves. And now I'd like to introduce Sherry Litwack, who will give us the background on the award we present here tonight. Good evening. The Ruth Ratner Miller Memorial Award for Excellence in American History was established in 1998 by a Concord resident, Richard Miller, to honor the life of his mother, who believed that understanding history was not merely desirable, but a civic and religious duty. Ruth Ratner Miller personally exemplified this belief as an original member of the Holocaust Commission and founding member of the Holocaust Museum in Washington, D.C. When Mr. Miller offered this award to the Concord Library seven years ago, his only request was that the award be used to support and promote the library. He understood the, that the library was more than a repository of books. It is a repository of our history as well as a constantly evolving epicenter of learning, a community center in the truest sense, offering children's programs, lectures, concerts, poetry readings, films, and book discussion groups, all free and open to the public. The role of the library continues to grow in new ways that bring more people, such as a special new area for teens and young adults, as, as well as greater accessibility to all parts of the library for all people. It is also particularly fitting for the Friends of the Concord Library to offer and present this award, since it is the mission of the Friends to expand the role of the library by offering programs to the community that stimulate and inspire. Our program tonight is a stellar example of how the Friends continu continually strive to fulfill this mission. The illustrious recipients of this award have distinguished themselves by writing about and teaching American history and sometimes, as in the case of tonight's honoree, by making history. In this way, we hope the award will symbolically represent the relevance of history and the importance of keeping it alive as, as Ruth Ratner Miller did so passionately in her lifetime. Charles Vert Willey, sociologist and professor emeritus at the Harvard Graduate School of Education, has written, his wife now tells me, not what I thought was a mere 30 books, but more like 35, and more than 100 articles on issues ranging from race, gender, socioeconomic status, religion, education, urban communities, and family relations. Pretty broad. Like our honoree this evening, Dr. Willey believes in walking his talk, in actively trying to solve the social problems of our country. His commitment to affecting change through applied psychology and education mirrors Dr. Franklin's own work in American history. It is with great pleasure that we welcome Concord's own Dr. Charles Willey.
thank you. I have a few friends, <laughs> as well as <clears throat> friends of the library. This is a wonderful pleasure for me to introduce John Hope Franklin. <clears throat> uh, I, I told him that uh, he was my role model and that when I grow up, I want to be just like him. <laughs> What a friend we have in Dr. John Hope Franklin, born in Rentersville, Oklahoma, on January 2nd, 1915. Now you can start computing <laughs> his age. He has jumped over every stumbling block and climbed every mountain that challenges a scholar and has come out on top. If you want to see a real scholar, here is one. Although Professor Franklin has written many important books in history, one title, From Slavery to Freedom, has caught the attention of a wide range of people. Although published in 1947, it still is in print, and the number of copies sold is near four million. If your children don't want to do homework, tell them they still can make a million if they are scholars, <laughs> if, particularly if they are scholars like John Hope Franklin. <laughs> John Hope Franklin is a scholar par excellence. He has held professional, professorial positions in higher education, three score and eight years, beginning in 1939 at St. Augustine's College in North Carolina. Later, he taught history at North Carolina College, Howard University, Brooklyn College, and topped off his career with endowed distinguished professorships at the University of Chicago and Duke University. He is a scholar whom everyone seems to respect within his discipline and elsewhere. He has been elected president of the American Historical Association and the Southern Historical Association, and his interdisciplinary reputation was endorsed when he was elected president of the United Chapters of Phi Beta Kappa. John Hope Franklin probably has been awarded more honorary degrees than any other scholar in this nation. He earned a BA degree and was given an honorary degree by Fisk, his alma mater, he earned a master's degree and a PhD degree and was given an honorary degree by Harvard, the school of his terminal degree. He has received honorary degrees from Yale and Princeton as well as from Howard and Morehouse, to name only a few of the schools who have honored him. And of course, Cambridge University in England and other universities overseas have conferred honorary degrees on him. Despite all the honors he has received, Dr. Franklin remains unpretentious with his colleagues, accessible to his students, kind in his criticisms, and he can be critical when he wants to, <laughs> and generous in his praise of others. These are significant aspects of the John Hope Franklin saga that are as important as his scholarly achievements. His public life and private life were well coordinated and unified so that each was supported and sustained by the other. For example, his best-selling book, From Slavery to Freedom, is dedicated to his wife, Aurelia, whom he married in 1940. He said his wife always had a good feeling about what was happening to him and knew what was appropriate. Moreover, he said, I know my life would not have been as stable personally as it has been if it had not been for my wife. He pursues a vigorous program of exercise and diet and cultivates 500 orchid, rare orchids, a bloom from one of which is usually exhibited in the lapel of his coat. Ladies and gentlemen, I present to you John Hope Franklin, a man with a magnificent mind and a gentle manner. Who could ask for anything else? 
We're pleased that you came to Conquer John to chat with us tonight and share with us your wisdom and to receive the Ruth Ratner Miller Award presented by the Friends of the Concord Free Public Library. John Ho Franklin. Thank you, Chuck. Uh, members of the great community of Concord and environs and uh, members of the committee that made this fateful decision to award me the Ruth Ratner Miller uh, Award. I am honored to be here. I'm particularly honored to be the recipient of this award, which I would represent the recognition of some of the things I have tried to do with my own life. And as I stand here and witness you in Concord, it is reminiscent of my own days a few miles away when I was a student at Cambridge. I had little time to visit uh, such communities as this, uh, and I had no way to visit them anyway. Uh, there were very few people that I knew that even had transportation uh, that would bring them to Concord and to Lexington and to places like that. Uh, we in addition to that, I had little time to visit anyway because of the obligations imposed upon us by uh, that institution not far away. <laughs> I'm especially pleased to receive the Ratner Award for it is itself a, a, a statement of the importance of libraries in our lives and I am particularly Pleased that uh, the Ratner Library, the Ratner Award, uh, focuses on its attention, at least for the time being, on me. <laughs> and uh, it uh, is an indication, I would say, that uh, my wife, who was a trained librarian with two library degrees, uh, let some of that rub off on me. And uh, she would, if she were living, would be immensely pleased that uh, you have so recognized me in this particular role. I uh, grew up without a library of, that was a public library. I lived in Tulsa, Oklahoma, and uh, we had a little storefront librarian, a library uh, that uh, held maybe <laughs> Uh, uh, a half dozen or so books, but not much else. Uh, we were not allowed to go to the public library. And uh, had, I not, had I not been the child of educated parents, both of whom were college graduates, uh, I would not have had a library experience until I left Tulsa, Oklahoma to go to college. But uh, being the child of educated parents and being the third, the, I'm sorry, the fourth uh, sibling, uh, a fairly good library, even children's library, had been accumulated by the time I came on the scene. <laughs> and so I'm grateful to my parents, but also to my sisters and brothers, my sisters and brother, uh, for their contribution to my education by not only insisting on and securing uh, library facilities of their own, library resources, but also of passing them on to me. So I was extremely fortunate uh, in uh, getting uh, that kind of, of, of basic experience 
at an early age. My clear association with the uh, library, though, as a, as, a, as a participant and particularly as an observer and, and to some extent official, began rather late in life. I was a professor at the University of Chicago. And when my secretary asked me one day if I could return a call that had come in when I was in class, and I said yes. And so she uh, got someone on the line who said, hello, Professor Franklin. I said, yes. He said, I'm your mayor, Dick Daly. <laughs> And uh, since I had no forewarning, I said, I almost said, yes, and I'm the, uh, the mayor of whatever. <laughs> uh, but I didn't. And he said, uh, I wonder if you could uh, uh, come down to see me. And I said, uh, sure, I'll be glad to see you. I, I still was doubtful that it was the mayor of Chicago. <laughs> And so I hung up the phone and went back to whatever I was doing and paid no more mind until the next year when we were celebrating the 50th anniversary of one of our colleagues who was retiring. And she was a historian of the city of Chicago and we were having it at the, at the public library on the north side in Chicago. And uh, toward the end of that program, uh, the doors flew open and there was Richard Daly coming to pay his respects to our colleague. Uh, he was brought to the platform where I was already sitting. And uh, the program was almost over and at the end of it, he came over to me and he said, Joe, you John Hope Franklin? I said, yes. <laughs> Uh, he said, uh, last spring I invited you to be a member of the library board and uh, you declined because of your preoccupation. He said, and I asked you to come down and talk to me about uh, problems. He said, I have many problems trying to run this city. He said, and you didn't come. And I said to myself, that's why you're mayor of Chicago. <laughs> if you can remember trivia like that, <laughs> uh, you, 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 you probably you should be mayor. And so he said, would you come down? I said, yes. So we, we from the day, I went down. And he said, uh, by that time, he was, he was on first name basis. I guess he was on that basis with everybody. <laughs> he said, John, I, I, I want you to become a member of the library board of the city of Chicago. I said, Your Honor, you're scraping the bottom of the barrel. He said, I just opened the barrel. Your name was on top. <laughs> I said, well, how can you cope with a man like this? He's too quick. And uh, I said, yes, I'll be glad to serve. He said, now, you'll have to appear before the city council. He said, now that's not, a, that's not a very serious hurdle. It might look to be because I have enemies on that council who will oppose everything that I try to do. <laughs> and uh, so I said, well, I, I will not uh, do anything to embarrass you or I won't say anything. He said, there's a hearing and people will be speaking uh, hopefully in your behalf, but he said, hey, I have enemies who will speak against you. And he mentioned one of them, Leon Dupre, who's in the Fifth Ward, he happened to be my own uh, alderman because I lived in, in the Fifth Ward near the University of Chicago. And uh, he said, well, don't pay any attention to him, he just, he's opposed to everything I want. And <clears throat> when uh, my name came up and I was there, on the hot seat, as it were, uh, and the mayor presented my name, and there were some speeches in favor of me, and, and then Leon Dupre got up, and uh, I could see the mayor you know, drawing himself up and thinking how much uh, 
Dupre would do to try to destroy my candidacy. And uh, Dupre instead got up and said, I want to commend the mayor of the city of Chicago for at last making an appointment that I can support. <laughs> and the mayor winced and uh, the council unanimously voted uh, for me. And I served from that day until almost the time that I left Chicago, some 15 years later. And that's the longest and most glorious tenure I think that I've ever had <laughs> as, the, as, the, as the member of the board of directors of the public library of the city of Chicago. Um, <clears throat> I was pleased in so many ways to be uh, on the board and to work diligently and to see the complexity of Chicago politics as well as the difficulty of, of garnering support for one of the great institutions of the city. And so <clears throat> uh, on, on occasion I was uh, in great support of the mayor's program. On other occasions I was not uh, because uh, it was clear to me that the mayor was using the uh, public library as, as a vehicle to support whatever it was that he wanted to have supported. And uh, there were some times when I could not support him. For example, when he, he built, uh, he had built uh, the Carter Woodson branch of the Chicago Public Library in the so-called black belt, uh, the black part of the city of Chicago. And uh, he was coming up for election. The building uh, was not nearly finished. It, was, it had only been just begun, but he wanted to present this as, a, as a, one of the great achievements of his administration. And so he planned a big dedication of the Woodson branch in the, quote, Black Belt of Chicago. Uh, this was a very good move, except that the building wasn't even half finished. Uh, the frame was up and some finishing had been done, but not anything like it. And it was a, a year from completion by that time. But they were having a big dedication and the library board was expected to attend. Well, they, uh, I learned from others who went, I did not go. And I made clear why I would not go. But this, was, this was merely being used by his honor to garner votes in the black community when the library was a year from completion. But he was pushing up the date he had potted palms on, on uh, the, the, the framework, uh, the floors and so forth, uh, to make it look as though it was just a, the completion and the opening was just around the corner. And here we were, here they were, dedicating uh, the library. And then we would sit back and wait for another year or year and a half before we could even go in to the library. So I refused to go and made it quite clear to my colleagues on the board why I would not go because we were being used, the library was being used uh, as a political football and I would not participate in it. The word got back to <coughs> the mayor <laughs> who by this time was one of my great and good buddies. <laughs> he, he, he was such a buddy that if he came into a meeting, like at the Chicago club or some other meeting where I was, and there was someone sitting by me, he would simply go and ask them to move. Because <laughs> he had to sit by his John, you know. <laughs> and so when the, president, when the mayor sent for me after the dedication of the Woodson Library, uh, I knew that he was going to really t give me a tongue lashing that would finish me off. And I was reluctant to go, except I said, well, this, maybe this will clear things up. I'll tell him what I think about him, and he, he'll tell me what he thinks about me, and we will have a parting of the way. And so I went down to see him, and uh, he welcomed me. I was surprised that he was so warm in his welcome. 
And he said, John, I want you to do something else for me besides the kind of wonderful work that you're doing on the library. <laughs> and he, he said, I want you to head up the Model Cities Project of uh, the city of Chicago. And I said to him, I said, John, you really, uh, I am much too busy. I have 12 PhD candidates that I'm shadowing, sh super supervising and shepherding toward their degree, and I just simply cannot do it. And uh, I begged off, and to my great astonishment, he first did not tongue lash me at all, and secondly, he acted like he was going to weep that I could not uh, accept his uh, appointment to chair the Model Cities Project. And I said uh, to myself as I got out of that that uh, I, I was much too close, much too involved, much too committed to the library or to the city of Chicago uh, to be this close to the mayor. And uh, I gradually from that point on uh, withdrew from all activities connected with the city of Chicago except the public library. And I kept to that until shortly before I retired from the University of Chicago and was leaving the city and I, I told the mayor that that was, that was it, that was all. And he praised me greatly. But that was a, a, a wonderful experience which I had, which uh, my wife particularly enjoyed my doing because um, she knew how much libraries generally meant to me and meant to her. And uh, she was particularly pleased that I had had the kind of experience and did have the understanding of what she was up to as a professional librarian. Uh, and that also gave me an insight into what we were trying to do as a couple and what I was trying to do professionally as a historian. Uh, <clears throat> the effort on the part of us as a couple was to uh, save as much of the materials that we were accumulating uh, for posterity. Uh, she came by this naturally. I came by this reluctantly. <laughs> I was not a rat pack and didn't, become, didn't intend to become one. I was uh, sort of above that. Uh, this is nitpicking and scraping and scrounging around. And I wasn't going to have any of that. I was professional, professional historian. Someone else had to do that. And uh, that was the way I felt until I began to consider writing an autobiography. I was going to, uh, and as I contemplated this, I thought of the difference between writing memoirs, as they were called, and writing an autobiography, as I called an authentic historical account. I didn't want to write my memoirs. You sit down and see what you could remember and then <laughs> write it down. <laughs> I'd had too much training as a historian not to subject my own career to the same kind of searching inquiry that I would make of any other, any other career. I had written an autobiography, I had written a biography. George Washington Williams, my favorite book, by the way, which people don't mention, but that's, that's, that's something. I, I commend it to you. <laughs> it's, uh, it hasn't had the run that it deserves. So if any of you want to read it, I'd be glad to. Uh, tell you how to get it, and, <laughs> and I'd be glad to encourage you in every way possible to read it. But <clears throat> as I sat down to write my own autobiography, I realized how inadequate my own, research, my own efforts had been to build the kind of resources on which a, a, a biography or an autobiography should be based. And so I began to say, now where can I start? I didn't have any. I hadn't saved anything. 
I had uh, lived richly, it says here, and uh, fully without doing anything about my own past, say nothing about my present. I went to college when I was 16. My mother and my father separately wrote me every week. What a great treasure trove that would have been for my own life if I could have saved that material. But I read it. Well, what do you do when you read a letter and you're a kid, 16, 17, 18, and you don't have anywhere to store things? So there's a trash basket here in my room, and so I would read the letter, feel deeply grateful for the letter, and then drop it in the wastebasket. And so there were four years of writing, a letter writing from my mother and my father, which went down the drain or down the incinerator or somewhere, but were not retained by me. And I reproached myself for the negligence, which I did not see until I was looking around trying to find uh, uh, some sources of information. How was I going to reconstruct my own life? How was I going to talk about myself as a child and as a college student, as a graduate student, and as a young professor if I didn't have any materials? And so I just stood there and wondered, what do I do? What do I do? How can I, how can I reconstruct my life? And I then began to sit and ponder what I did to work on George Washington Williams or to write the histories that I had written. And I said, I'll, I'll subject myself to the same kind of research. I don't have to have letters of my parents. Uh, I don't need to see, although it would be much easier, to see what I did as a child. They are the unpublished census schedules that will at least sketch out my life, tell me where I lived, when I lived, tell me how many people were in my family, how many, who the neighbors were and everything. And I then began to work seriously about my own life. Uh, I knew that I could get the 1920 census schedules. That's, that was the first one I could get. You have to be dead, uh, you have to have lived 70 years, and when this rule was made, the presumption was that everybody would be, would be dead who was 70. <laughs> but if you were 70, if you lived 70 years, you could go back and look at the census materials of the near years, the first year, first census year after you were born. That was for me, 1920. So I got the unpublished census schedule, not the, not the printed statistical reports that you see on the shelf, but the unpublished census schedules and the census taker's hand. And I began to look at that. For Rennesville, Oklahoma, this place of my birth, McIntosh County, Oklahoma. And there we were, all listed. B.C. Franklin, Molly Lee Franklin, Mozella Franklin, B.C. Franklin, Jr., and Harriet Franklin. And then in 1915, it was John Hope Franklin. <laughs> <laughs> but I knew most of that, but I did not know, I couldn't remember who the neighbors were. And I was able to go down the road and, 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 and reconstitute my neighbors, all of them. They were there. And as I read about them in the census, I could remember some things about them. And with my memory, and with the written reports, and with the accounts that I was able to get from my schoolmates, classmates, playmates, and so forth, I was able to reconstruct my life to a remarkable degree from, not from my memory, but from the records themselves. The same thing I did for high school, same thing I did for college. I did not 
keep any records until I was chairman of the history department at Brooklyn College and the records were kept for the city of New York, not for me. But I could look over the shoulders of my two secretaries that I had and could reconstruct my life from that point on. But before that time, I was able to do it uh, the way I did research for any other project. I was at working in the library one day, uh, and this was uh, at uh, the Library of Congress, and someone talked to me and said, what are you working on? I said, I'm working on the biography of John Hope Franklin. <laughs> uh, and that's exactly what I was doing, and I was doing it the way I had done it for Williams and for other people whose lives I researched, on whose lives I researched. And in that way, I was able to construct a, a, a credible and I hope accurate account of my early uh, adventures in this, on this planet. Uh, <clears throat> I know that there were times when I was discouraged and there were times when I did not know where to turn, but then I did precisely what I had done when I was doing research on other matters. I asked myself the question, if this won't work, what will work? When can I, when, where and when can I get certain types of materials? And the result was that I was able to build up a research account, a research account, uh, in much the same way that I could on any other subject I was working on. And I, I, I honestly believe that this is the difference between a, a, a memoir and an autobiography. Uh, you can sit down and write a memoir, and what you don't know, you can look over your shoulder and if nobody's looking, you can fill in something <laughs> uh, that, uh, that may not fit, but who knows, besides you, whether it fits or not. So uh, the honest biographer is one who is not a memoirist, but one who works diligently at his task. Now, I don't want to represent the fact that uh, you can, that your memory is, is, uh, is very strong, robust, and reliable. I remember so well when I was working on Mirror to America, my own autobiography. Uh, I, there were experiences which I, I said, well, I don't need, I don't need to look up anything. I remember, I remember this. I remember so well my experience at the opera, um, I was a kid, I was 13, 14. The opera came to Tulsa, the Chicago Civic Opera came to Tulsa. And um, my mother said, uh, when I was telling her about it, she said, you're not going, are you? I said, yes. She said, have you talked with your daddy about this? I said, no. I said, Miss and I called the name of my music teacher, wants me to go, and I said, I know you all want me to go, because Miss Person said that I should go. He said, to my father then was in the conversation, he said, is it segregated? I said, it's at the convention hall. He said, that's where I was detained during the race ride. And he said, and it's still segregated. And you will go? I said, Dad, it's the opera. He said, I don't care what it is. We don't segregate ourselves willingly, voluntarily. He said, that's what you'll be doing. You'll be bringing shame on yourself and the family. I, I, I know my, my father was a lawyer, and he pleaded the case, but I, I was learning how to argue too. <laughs> and uh, I finally said, he said, well, he, he had a soft spot. I said, Daddy, this, this means so much to me. I love opera, and I want to hear whatever it was. He said, well, you go ahead. He said, but remember, your mother and I disapprove of it because you are voluntarily segregating yourself, which you should never do. He said, and you remember that that my view is that a person who does that should reproach himself. You should be ashamed. And I went on off to the opera. Well, 
When I got to working on this particular period in my own autobiography, I thought I could, I thought I remembered all that. And uh, particularly did I think that I could remember what happened the night Paul Whiteman came to Tulsa. This is not the opera, but he's a, he's the leading jazz conductor of the period, 1926, 27, 28. And uh, I was going to write about it because by that time I persuaded my mother and father to let me even go to hear Paul Whiteman. And uh, he was doing, here my memory, I thought was enforcing my views, but they were not. Paul Whiteman was playing, I thought, the Rhapsody in Blue. It had just come out. And that George Gershwin, of all people, was, uh, was the soloist. And uh, I, I said, well, I'll, I'll check. I'll check this out. At that time, I'm, I'm able to just flip the pages of the paper and find out. And so I, I went to the newspaper, the local newspaper, for 19, the spring of 1927. And uh, sure enough, Paul Whiteman came, and he played. But George Gershwin was not there. And they didn't play, nobody played Rhapsody in Blue. <laughs> uh, some man whose name I'd never heard of was a soloist playing George Gershwin's Concerto in F. That's how your memory can play tricks on you, you see. And had I not looked this up and verified it, I would have said that I would have written and you would have been reading, I hope you would have been reading, <laughs> uh, my autobiography in which I said that Paul Whiteman came to Tulsa accompanied by George Gershwin <laughs> who played Rhapsody in F. Concerto, concerto in that. And I would have been wrong, you would have been misled, and we would have lived happily, but erroneously ever after. <laughs> uh, so that uh, even if one is a stalwart and can remember, uh, one must question his own memory uh, to the point that he can uh, verify what his memory tells him and in some instances he can uh, do just the opposite he can renounce what his memory says because the records say something else quite differently one other example uh, when my when my wife who was a librarian as I told you uh, became very interested in in documenting things, and I would poo-poo the idea and said, oh, I can remember these things, and yeah, I don't need, don't need any memory. Uh, and she would say, well, you, you, you'll find out that you will. And uh, it was when I was working on Mirror to America, and I was trying to get together my foreign travels, I traveled a great deal. I was uh, on the Fulbright Board for some years and I was chairman of the Fulbright Board. The Near East and South Asia were my beat and I would go out two and three times a year, particularly when I was at the University of Chicago, which was liberal enough to have you to teach only two quarters out of four and, uh, and you had the spring quarters, you were too pleased. And I didn't do all the time as I pleased, but I frequently <laughs> traveled in the Near East and South Asia. And, I was writing this uh, autobiography and I, I just couldn't get these records together. I got some materials from the Department of State, but the personal activity, the personal approaches, personal contacts uh, were not in the regular reports of the Department of State, even the ones that I wrote and sent in. Whom did I see in Iraq? Whom did I see in Cairo? Whom did I see in Delhi? Uh, and you know how I found out? My wife 
the Rat Pack, <laughs> had kept all of my letters, and I wrote her almost daily, all of my letters, I gave her every kind of de detail because I was reproaching myself for having gone away and left her anyway. So I, I filled her in as much as I could. <laughs> and my son, who, who has a way of prowling around the house, when he came back on a visit once, he went in his mother's room, went through her things and found these letters that I had written her from Iraq and from Cairo and from the Near East and various other places. And there was the detail by which I could enrich my own writings uh, in a fashion that I had never dreamed I would be able to do because uh, I had uh, neglected to keep records myself and had, of course, uh, reproached her <laughs> for keeping the records, uh, without which I could not have written my autobiography, uh, certainly not the way I was able to do it. So that I can uh, say that uh, saving the records is, uh, is important. One last word. I am now a crusader in behalf of this library and all other libraries, begging you to save your records. <laughs> don't throw them in the wastebasket or anywhere else. Save them. And don't save them at home. Give them to your public library. <laughs> and they will keep the records. And you will live happily ever after. And all our lives will be enriched by the contributions with you, historians, all of you are, which you have made to tomorrow, without which we will not know how to turn or how to look back. I'm so pleased that I'm able to, I believe, I'm able to enlist all of you in this great crusade, saving the records and keeping the records straight. Thank you very much. Before we um, conclude this evening's program and present the award, Dr. Franklin has graciously agreed to field some questions. This probably cannot uh, refer to what was in the wastebasket, <laughs> but it can refer to any other thing that you might care to ask him. Were there any questions that anyone would like to ask? Yes. Could you retell your story about attempting to uh, volunteer for World War II for military service? <laughs> oh, you, I think you already know it, don't you? <laughs> uh, you want some, we, we, we want us all to know it. Well, I don't mind telling it at all. Uh, I was uh, teaching at uh, St. Augustine's College, a small Episcopal college for Negroes in Raleigh, North Carolina. My first regular teaching job. Um, I uh, was, uh, uh, this was when I got my PhD here uh, at Harvard in the spring of 1941. You remember that we were not in the, um, we were not in the war yet. And uh, I have described that commencement to where I got my degree as a, as a kind of a war rally, uh, and it was, it, it, it bordered on obscenity, really, uh, particularly for anyone who was peace-loving the way I was. Uh, but when the war came, as it did in the fall of 1941, with the bombing of Pearl Harbor, and with uh, my having such a sh short um, draft number, a low draft number, that I could see myself almost immediately being drafted. We had a conscripted army, as you know, in World War II. Uh, I thought that perhaps it would be best for me to uh, go down and, and uh, volunteer so that I could have, so that I could pick my, my, my choice, my, my slot. Uh, they were desperate. I, one of the things about reading of this period is that you see these these, these great ads 
by, sponsored by the Navy and the Army and the, uh, the less extent the Air Force and the Marines, uh, begging for volunteers, begging for volunteers. Uh, they could not draft uh, the kind of people they wanted for specialized activities, such as keeping records, uh, writing uh, the preliminary drafts for the history of the war, and all the other things, the reports that had to be made. You couldn't, you couldn't draft people to do that. You had to pick them out. So I volunteered, and they, I went down, I was in Raleigh, and uh, I went down to the public library, uh, and uh, that's where the recruiting was. And uh, I waited my turn, and I went to the recruiting officer. He said, well, what can you do? I told him that I wanted to, I was, wanted to volunteer for the Navy. Uh, and he said, what can you do? I said, well, I can manage an office. I, uh, I was a secretary to the librarian for four years when I was an undergraduate. And I not only managed that, room, that office, but I was able to take dictation, uh, because, and I was able to type. I have four gold medals in typing. <laughs> uh, you did that when you were in high school. You got the gold medals for typing perfect papers. And uh, I said, oh, yeah, and I have a PhD from Harvard. <laughs> he, said, he said, you have everything but color. And I said to myself, you have to recruit people of color, of a certain color, to fight Hitler? He's do that's what he's doing. Or to fight uh, the Japanese, you have to be a certain color? That's what I said to myself. I said to him, I said, oh, I'm so sorry I took up your time. Uh, I thought there was an emergency. <laughs> But apparently there's not. And I bade him good day. And I spent the next four years, I'm proud to say, I spent the next four years fighting the United States Army, Navy, Air Force, Marines, who thought I was not good enough to fight Hitler unless I was scraping and scrubbing the floors and cooking the meals for the elite who were fighting Hitler. I said, you can scrub the floors yourself. And if you don't have any better sense than to keep me out of the war, except to wash dishes and peel potatoes, I'll show you how I'll stay out of the war and do, doing the very thing that you uh, disapprove of, but I'll, I'll do it, and you won't get me. And I did it for four years on J Day, on DJ Day in 1945. I got my last draft, and I got out of that just as I had gotten out of them for three and a half years earlier by outsmarting these people. I'm not ashamed of it. I would have done anything to stay out. Why not? <laughs> I had to jump through hoops, racial hoops to jump to be in. I can jump through racial hoops to stay out. <laughs> so when I went down to the draft board once, they put me in, they put me in 1A every six months. So you get out of 1A and get into some kind of other classification. And I was called down once. And they said, well, what, what is your argument? What do you, why, do you, why, do you, why can't you be drafted? I said, well, I'm, I'm, I'm in an I'm in a occupation where there's a shortage. They said, history, shortage of people in history? I said, oh, yes, yes, by all means. They said, and they grabbed their books and went through it. And they said, we don't see history there. I said, this book that you're looking at was compiled by white people. I said, you know, we do everything separately in this country. <laughs> I said, do you know how many black P 
PhDs there are in the state of North Carolina? I said, no. I said, there are two. If you draft me, you reduce the supply by 50%. <laughs> They didn't know what to say about that. But they took me out of 1A at that time. But six months later, I was back in 1A. Uh, and I had to think of another tale <laughs> to tell. But I would think about, that was, my, that was my job. Their job was to draft me. My job was to stay undrafted. <laughs> I, as Joe Lewis would say, I'm glad I won. I'm sorry. I, my answers are too long. I promise I won't answer. I won't. What's that? I'm from the city of Worcester, and I was pleased to learn that George Washington Williams yes. lived there for several years. Uh, I wonder if you'd say a few words about that Worcester Hall. Yes. Uh, the Worcester Hall is where George Washington Williams was born. Washington Williams yes. lived in Worcester. He's from Worcester. Yes. I'm writing a history of the city. Yes. I have your book. Yes. But I wonder if you'd say a few words about him, that wonderful, beautiful man. I wish I knew more about Williams uh, from the beginning. He was born in western Pennsylvania and he, uh, he sort of just grew up like Topsy, although he had a mother and father, but he had no, no training, no, no, he, was, he was not schooled at all. And he, when, when the war came in 1861, he set his age up, used the name of a relative and volunteered and saw action in various parts of Pennsylvania and then Virginia and on down and, and uh, was wounded and uh, was recovered and then uh, was mustered out of the army and he didn't have enough of it and he went back and he re-enlisted in the army. He didn't have enough of it there and he volunteered for the, uh, the Mexican army and he served there a while. Then he came back in the United States, registered at Fort Sill in now Oklahoma, the Indian Territory, and he was injured there. The court martial records say, not in the line of duty, which I couldn't quite determine. I have not yet determined that. Uh, then he decided by that time he wanted to be a minister. And so he heard that there was a Howard University had just been founded, and he went he, he, he did what it became so characteristic of Williams. He wrote the president of Howard University. He didn't write the registrar or anybody. He wrote the president and told the president uh, that he wanted to be a student there. And the president, or Oliver Otis Howard, simply endorsed his letter and said, admit if qualified. Well, he was admitted even though he wasn't qualified. <laughs> and, uh, he, by that time, had decided he wanted to be a minister. And so he uh, uh, found the going very slow at Howard because he was being, he was taking all kinds of things that didn't have anything to do with the ministry. And so he quit there. And he heard of Newton Theological Institution right out here. And he came up here and applied and they turned him down. He didn't have any qualifications to be in the Newton Theological Institution. Uh, and he asked if he could appear before the uh, admissions committee. And that's where they made their mistake. <laughs> he appeared and impressed them so that they admitted him. They admitted him though to the English course, that is the remedial program. And he went in there, and he was so good in there, they admitted him to the regular program. That was the other mistake. Four years later, he finished first in his class and gave the commencement oration on early Christian missions in Africa. And after that, he was on his way. A year after he was uh, graduated from Newton, he became the pastor of the 12th Baptist Church in Boston the largest African-American Baptist church in this area. And uh, he then went to Washington, become the editor of the Commoner, and then went to Cincinnati as the pastor of the Baptist church there, 
and uh, instead of having prayer meetings on Wednesday nights, he had he gave a lecture series. He had a lecture series. He said people needed to be taught more than they needed to pray, <laughs> and he put them in these courses and and then uh, he ran for the state legislature and won the first black member of the legislature in the state of Ohio and then he's really off then I, I could I could go on indefinitely because I, I spent 40 years doing research on this book uh, and so there's a lot that I'm leaving out obviously uh, but in, in due course, he, he became uh, a very distinguished uh, historian, studied extensively, and wrote the first volume, the first two volumes, of, called A History of the Negro Race in America, 1619-1880. Um, and it was when I was working on From Slavery to Freedom, which is a history of African Americans uh, covering roughly the same period, uh, I, it was then that I encountered him. And uh, I began to work on him even as I wrote From Slavery to Freedom. And uh, although it, I wrote From Slavery to Freedom in 13 months, it took me 40 years to, re to reconstruct this man's life. His most remarkable life that I've ever encountered and the most extensive work that I've ever done on anything. And uh, if you, you don't know how gratifying it is to, to reconstruct a life, to, to, to take nothing and, and, and to put breath into it as I did, uh, it, it's, it's a sense of, of wonder and a sense of achievement that I can live with the rest of my life. Sorry. We'll take one more question. Yes. Professor, could you tell us a little bit about the flower in your lapel, please? <laughs> I didn't put it up to this, fl this flower in my lapel is a phalaenopsis. It looks like, very much like the flower that's named for me. It's a white flower with a red lip. Uh, and it could be, although the phalaenopsis John Hope Franklin is extinct, has been declared extinct. Uh, because in the last freeze I lost all of mine and uh, I don't, we can't find any of them. Uh, another has been uh, named for me, uh, another kind of orchid altogether, Lady O'Catalea, John Hope Franklin. Uh, there was a phalaenopsis that was named for my wife in memory of her after she died uh, by a South Carolina orchid raiser. Uh, but, uh, and, and that is, is a marvelous orchid is being considered for several prizes now. Uh, but uh, this, uh, I'm, an, I'm an orchid addict. Uh, and I have about 500. And uh, I, it, it's my passion, it's my passion. I, uh, I grow them and nothing would take their place ever. <laughs> Where do you grow them? Do you have them in your house? No, I have a greenhouse. You do? Yes. We have one more question for you, sir. Can you tell us a little bit about your children? My child. Your child. My child is uh, is a is a kid. Uh, he's 55 now, <laughs> and uh, he lives in Washington D.C. or Silver Spring, Maryland. Um, he went to Stanford uh, to college and. He spent eight years teaching English as a foreign language in Senegal. Uh, and uh, he uh, came back and went to graduate school at the School of Advanced International Studies at uh, Johns Hopkins. Uh, and he left there and joined the staff of the Smithsonian Institution 20 years ago, where he still is. And he is uh, director of partnerships and international affairs at the new Museum of African American History and Culture of the Smithsonian Institution. <coughs> Thank you.
The friends of the Concord Free Public Library are delighted to confirm the 2007 Ruth Ratner Miller Award for Excellence in American History on one of America's most preeminent historians working today, John Hope Franklin. In making this presentation, we honor Mrs. Miller's commitment to the importance of remembrance in our lives. I would like to take a minute to show you what the award looks like and to explain it, what it is. Uh, when, the Concord, when Concord's first library was built in 1873, it was surrounded by an iron fence. The fence posts were capped with finials similar to this one, which is a fleur de -lis. Um, during the 1930s renovation of the library, the fence was taken down, but the finials were, were salvaged, and therein began a tradition which continues to, the, to this day. Retiring library trustees and others who make an outstanding contribution to this historic community resource are the recipients of this award, this finial. Dr. Franklin, if you would join me again, please. Sir, your contributions to our nation's understanding of its past cannot be overstated. You have endeavored to complete the American story by chronicling the struggles of African Americans to be heard and to be remembered, to be equal before the law and before their fellow citizens. It is my honor indeed to present you with this award tonight. Thank you and congratulations. <laughs> I just want to say a word. I'm standing on the very high ground of uh, been placed there because I stand on the shoulders of uh, Ruth Ratner Miller and all the others who've gone on before me who've done so much to preserve our culture and our history and to pass it on to us as a great experience in education. Um, I'm embarrassed to say that uh, almost all of these people who have received the, the uh, Miller Award uh, are friends of mine. <laughs> and, uh, so if you ever have a reunion of uh, recipients, I want to come <laughs> and meet my, meet my many friends. <laughs> Thank you very much. Appreciate it.